This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you right there listening right now. Thanks to you. Maybe you're Tim Deputy or Brandon Brooks or Hector Bones or one of our brand new bosses, Connoru or Harold. Both just started backing us on Patreon. Thanks, Connoru. And thanks, Harold. Coming up on DTNS, what is a digital twin? Rob DeMillo has worked with them, and he explains the difference between a twin and a model. Plus, DirecTV still has the NFL, kind of. And do you like the new Leica? Sarah does. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, May 26, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, Chief Technology Officer at Skidmore, Owings & Merrill, Rob DeMillo. Welcome back. Hello, everyone. Good to see y'all. Thank you for bringing your twin knowledge. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Your digital twin. Knowledge. My digital twin knowledge. Yeah. 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 Be specific. It, are we talking to Rob or Rob's digital twin? We'll You'll never, never tell. Know. You'll yeah. never know. <laughs> All right. Let's start with the quick hits. Google started rolling out its search generative experience to search results for some users that already requested early access. This not only uses generative AI for results, but also sorts responses into colorful cards. The experimental feature is opt-in, and Google said the feature would initially be available for a limited time. The augmented reality glasses maker Nreal announced it is no longer called Nreal. It is now called Xreal. They just fought to have the right to use the name Nreal and then thought, you know what? <laughs> Let's just change it anyway. Uh, the company also announced the now called Xreal Beam, a small device that lets its glasses connect to a smartphone, gaming console, or PC, either wired over USB-C or wirelessly. It's about the size of a deck of cards or an old iPod, something like that. Pre-orders open June 1st, no pricing was announced. Uh, well, we do have pricing for Twitter API Pro, the company's new API pricing tier that costs $5,000 per month. It includes the ability to gather up to 1 million tweets and post 300,000 tweets per month as well. In other API news, an email seen by The Independent shows that Twitter plans to require academic researchers using its DecaHose feed to subscribe to its enterprise pricing tier when their existing contracts renew. Current contracts cost a few hundred dollars a month. The DecaHose provided academics with a random 10% sample of the Twitter firehose. Twitter also said academics not renewing contracts would have to expunge all Twitter data stored and cached in your systems. Good luck with that. The yeah. computer brain interface company Neuralink uh, announced that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has cleared it for its first human in human clinic trial. Yeah, not dogs. Humans in human clinical trial. Uh, no word on what the study would specifically look at, and Neuralink said it had not started recruiting for it yet. But it is a big step for Neuralink to go from just demos and 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 statements to actually being allowed to conduct trials. According to the app intelligence firm Data.ai, OpenAI's ChatGPT iOS app surpassed 500,000 downloads within six days of launching. In fact, I think it launched just a week ago today. Since 2022, only the Truth Social app saw more downloads in the U.S. in that same window. All right. Let us discuss sports bars uh and rob you are excused from this conversation Actually, I, i'm gonna i'm gonna just excuse myself back. i'll have a question for you at the end of this as someone who oh. never goes to sports bars but oh. uh youtube tv may have the rights to show nfl sunday ticket to home users in the u.s but if you go to a bar or a restaurant or even like a casino or something uh the games still come from direct tv NFL Sunday Ticket lets subscribers pay to watch all the Sunday NFL football games, if you're unfamiliar with how it works. And after 28 years, the service is moving to YouTube TV for home users. Yeah, after 28 years, not 28 years now. No, 28 years of direct TV, and now <laughs> yeah. it's moving to YouTube TV. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But as you mentioned, Tom, bars and restaurants still need a special license to show games, which Direct TV for Business does cover. Direct TV has renewed that part of the deal with the NFL. And you might not realize that Direct TV's business service also carries games streamed exclusively on Peacock, Apple TV Plus, and Amazon Prime Video. If you're thinking that, well, that would be great, I want that in my home as well, the price is, in the past, has been based on occupancy of the business, starting at $650 per season for Sunday ticket and getting more expensive for larger venues. YouTube TV's version starts at $349 for the season. 
Yeah. So I, I, I just thought this was interesting uh, because a lot of people may not realize that when you're watching in a bar, it's not a cable subscription. Uh, even if you're watching Amazon Prime Video, it's not Amazon Prime Video. You are watching DirecTV business in most cases. There, there are a few other providers out there. I know a lot of the cable companies have commercial versions mm -hmm. of services, but DirecTV is the biggest provider of these these sorts of things because they have all these deals. And while they've been letting them go with their, with their consumer version of the service, uh, they are beefing them up and becoming the place to go if you want to have a sports bar. I was uh, at a sports bar, well, a bar that shows sports uh, just last this night. Morning. Oh, yeah. nice. <laughs> just, just one hour ago uh, for lunch. It was real quick. Uh, no, it was. It was we, we aren't judging. Yesterday, we're, no, we're, we're, we were watching some basketball and some golf. But, uh, but yeah, this particular bar, which shall not be named, uh, does not <laughs> subscribe to this. They're kind of doing a little bit of a, we're acting like a home, but we are a business type mm -hmm. thing. Um, mm -hmm. And because of that, uh, things are a little bit more limited. You can't just sort of say, hey, put on the game on channel whatever, because you're going to have it. Um, so, you know, whether or not you're worried about getting in trouble, there are some restrictions there. But otherwise... Yeah, I'd love to have bar privileges to watch everything for one hundred fifty dollars or three hundred fifty dollars rather for a season. No, it's gonna be it's gonna cost you six fifty, and you have to have the business service. I think I, I don't think you can yeah. just get NFL Sunday ticket, and the business service is is more expensive as well because it's covering the licensing that allows you to essentially do a public performance when you when you show TV in a bar or a restaurant. It's it's considered a public performance. So whenever you hear those disclaimers on sports, you know the rights are reserved by the Major League Baseball. Any public performance, et cetera, et cetera. That's what they're talking about. About. Like you need to have, you need to pay extra to have those rights. DirecTV covers that. Other companies cover it too. Uh, and, it, and it looks like DirecTV for business is covering it well. Uh, the other piece of DirecTV news today is that DirecTV Stream is going to start giving away those tele uh, free TVs that we talked about. The ones oh, that have the oh. very that have the intense extra... terms of service. Really? Yeah. Oh. yeah. 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 So there, the way that's working is if you are a DirecTV Stream user who takes advantage of that that offer, you'll be put higher on the priority list, on the wait list for that free tele TV. Uh, that is the question I have for you, Rob. Like that terms of service re requires that TV to be your primary television. You no. can't, you can't put it in a spare room. You got to let it spy on you. Uh, it, 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 would you, would you want it even if it was free with a subscription? Why, why? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> why would you do that? I yeah. mean, if you if you can, if you can get all this stuff on on YouTube TV, you know, if they're running all those deals on YouTube TV, why would you agree to? Well, do and to be clear, like, Directv Stream is the home version of Directv, of course, so of it's course. not going to give you all of this yeah. stuff that like you know Amazon what? Prime Video. You know, I'll put out a couple of beers, open up the windows, invite a few friends over, and then get uh, yeah. <laughs> get the Directv service. All right, Sarah, there is a camera that seems to have caught your eye today. Indeed, it has. I haven't bought a standalone camera in some time. But I I like to I like to follow the camera news as does our very own Rich Drofolino, who's uh you know sort of our resident camera person, um, who threw this story our way. Leica introduced the Q3, which is an update to its 28 millimeter fixed lens mm. full frame camera, offering a new 60 megapixel sensor, can shoot up to 8K video, and record in Apple ProRes at 1080p. It's the first in the Q series to offer a tilting rear touch screen and also uses more modern phase detect autofocus. It's IP52 water and dust resistance, offers wireless charging through an optional hand grip, and is available for pre-order, if this all sounds good to you, for $5,995. Now, Rich uh, noted when, when he saw that we were going to talk about this today that it's it's been a week for camera announcements. We had the yeah. Sony ZV-1 II, we had the Canon R100, the Fuji X-S20. Those are all fairly creator-focused, vlogger cameras, if you will, but this one, this one's pro, right? It's yeah. very pro, uh, and the price reflects that. If you're familiar with Leica, Leica is a, I mean, I don't want to say it's like a hipster camera because it's it's a it's a it's a it's a beautiful camera and its line of cameras are sort of top tier not it's only a hip brand you, it's, it's a not, hip it's, brand it's not a yeah. shallow camera it, 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 yeah. no it's been the, certainly not it's been the camera for I mean it is the camera yeah, yeah like if you if you can if you can part yeah. with six thousand dollars and you're going to use the features. Uh, this is, you know, certainly going to be in the running. Uh, one of the things, though, that seems to have people uh, very divided is that tilting rear touchscreen. Oh, um, you know, I mean, like I mean, a, 
it, sorry, Roger, go ahead. Oh no, no, I, I was gonna say it's like they I'm finally jump included all over something. They finally included an articulated screen on the back of the camera that they didn't have for the longest yeah. time. Yeah, you, you may think that's not that big of a deal out there, but if you're a Leica fan, this is something you've been maybe jealous of that other cameras had that Leica did not. I, is it? Will, is it though? I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean so, so so if you're if you're a Leica fan, you're you're probably a professional photographer or a semi pro, uh, or, or a very uh, Excited you like expensive for, furniture. You, you like uh, it. You I mean, get yeah, it? You, yes, I get it. I see what you do there. So <laughs> it, this is not a selfie camera. This is not a thing right, where, right. like, who cares? Like, nobody wants – you've got your phone. You want to take a selfie with your phone. Go ahead and do that. This is this is for um, high-resolution photography. This is for all the bells and whistles that you normally get with um, – that you used to get, actually, with uh, uh, physical lens cameras. Uh, and it's in the same price range that professional cameras have always been. So I, I think they're just hitting that spot. That's all. I, I mean, I... okay, go ahead. The, the, all right. So I'm going to be, let it out, Roger. Debbie let it do it, Roger. Here. I can see it. So, I can see your eye. So this is the thing. Like, uh, at least in the digital space for the longest time has been sort of positioned as kind of the camera person's camera. That is in the same way that the BMW has always been the driver's machine. Um, Honestly, I think six grand is kind of a bit much. You're paying you're paying for maybe thirty five hundred dollars worth of technology, and then spending another twenty five hundred dollars so you have like sure. glued to the front. Um, it's it's a very capable camera. It does feature a lot, but there's a lot of granted bulkier, larger you know cameras that do a lot of the same things and additional and additional functionality for around the same price. So it is a compact, very small form factor, full frame, and this is the this is the key. It's a full frame sensor, so you can get <laughs> a sixty megapixel shot with a backlit sensor that is going to look stunning. But the question I still have is: it worth six grand? And everything I've read up on it doesn't really point to yes on it. It's everyone who's tested really enjoys it, but when you come down to the value uh, mm. uh, proposition. Is six grand really? Do, do you think it's better to spend six thousand dollars on on another camera, or a camera with some accessories that you would be able to, or a cheaper that? camera that you could you yeah. could gin yeah. up with some accessories? But that's, yeah, because I mean, that's, anybody that's, who's in that prosumer level knows that. I mean, just buying a couple lenses. Well, it depends yeah. as the it depends well, on the lenses, but like that's going to yeah. go up to six thousand dollars pretty quickly. Yeah. Just yeah. lenses and alone. When you buy a camera, I mean, at least if you're you're doing it either as a hobby or as a as a life, uh, as a living, you buy into the system, right? You're buying either into the the Canon mount, you're buying Nikon mount, Sony mount, whatever, and then mm -hmm. hopefully maybe there's a third party like Tokina that makes a lens for your mount. Um, I, it's 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 an it's it's definitely a very uh, a, a very attractive a very seductive product. Six grand still pretty steep. It is it is pretty steep, but no, nothing's changed. I mean, that has been, you know, their price yeah. point has been the three to six to eight thousand for, for like a long yeah, for, for a long like long it. time, right? So so your beef is not with this camera, your mm. beef is with Leica. It's and, the yeah. the cost of putting that name on it. Yeah, yeah, of, of course, but there's a reason for it, right? Mm -hmm. So I. I, I I, yeah, can't I, mean, the, point, I can't believe I'm being the Leica apologist here, but but like <laughs> somebody so, needs to be. Thank you, Rob. So, so in my it, it, you know my old world of doing animation and all the rest of the stuff, um, it, Leica did a lot of experimentation, right? So they they yeah. put a lot of money into these kind of uh, funky you know two hundred fifty thousand dollar rigs that would do interesting things for special effects, right? And and do tracking and all that other stuff. So so they're doing a lot of work uh, in the optical engineering space, and there's a price for that. Yeah. Comma, yes. And Leica adds another couple of grand onto the, you know, gluing the name on I mean, the they're, camera. They're I mean, even, they're, even the glass, if you use with like an adapter from 20 years ago, is still amazing, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's just the yeah. quality manufacturing, but also the formula that they, they put into making the glass. I, you, the, you get a great lens on a, a, a good body, but again, it, you go back to there are a lot of competent competitors to this product. There, there, so, all right. So there are. Three hundred dollar watches. There are twenty five thousand dollar watches. Mm, does, that's a good. Does, yes. does one make one better right. than the other? I mean, mm -hmm. the twenty five thousand dollar watches is assembled by hand by a little old, you know, mm. Swiss guy in a back room somewhere. <laughs> but it's whereas, a little whereas, different though, because the twenty five dollar watch tells time. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure there's a clock perfectly. 
I'm sure there's a. I'm sure there's a you don't say. Out. Yeah, the time was a little blurry on that. No, no, the no. The time no. is worth ten thousand dollars. <laughs> the, the argument here is luxury item versus non-luxury yeah. item, yeah. prosumer versus consumer. Right. That's your. That's your actual concern. And 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 you know, there's a there's a valid argument there. But to take that camera out of that realm and put it into, is it worth it? Yeah, of course it's worth it. I mean, if that's if that's your price point for a camera, yeah. Why would you not? Well, jump in. Let us know uh, where, where you are. You fall on this spectrum. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to tell you something entirely uncontroversial that you will just agree with. Uh, I have decided what the top five greatest tech companies of all time are, and it's in my new episode of Top 5, available at YouTube.com slash DailyTechNewsShow. Nope, there's no reason to argue. There's only five great tech companies of all time, uh, and I've decided unilaterally what they are. Who could possibly possibly disagree with me uh go find out what they are at youtube.com slash daily tech news show can, can i guess singer sewing machine etzel um yeah no spoilers like uh like uh like i thought you were starting a second could be could be, I, uh, yeah <laughs> you're saying like a <laughs> back on april 7th we discussed a next web article about digital twins it talked about a book from professors Peter Convany and museum director Roger Highfield about using digital twins of people modeling all their internal workings just like you would with an airplane. So a couple of examples we discussed back then uh, were Barcelona Supercomputing Center's Alia Red, which is a digital twin of a heart used to do things like help position a pacemaker. Uh, Comp Biomed worked with Germany's Super Muck NG to model blood flow in a 26-year-old woman. And some models have been approved for what are called in silico drug trials. Trials where where you use the model to do drug testing, uh, Rob. You've actually worked with yeah. digital twins. Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience and and what the difference is between this and just a model. So I've worked with them a few times in my career. Uh, so digital twinning comes from NASA. So it, 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 long time ago, they were using digital twins to model rocket engines and how they would respond to to turbulence and heat and a bunch of other things and and design changes and that kind of thing. Um, so. I used to work at uh, NASA JPL, and so there's there's some of that there. But um, m my biggest uh, brush with digital twinning came when I worked for the FAA, where we would model weather around airports <clears throat> uh, digitally, and then we'd, we'd put planes in the air, uh, test pilots in the air that to to run through where the model predicted that so the heavy weather was. digital test pilots then? A little bit, yeah. I mean, but, you know, they were... Actually, there was a fun crew, and there's a whole story we could tell about this at some other time. So, but but, but I, I, so, were people actually in planes in real life, or these? these yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. No, okay. these are the guys that flew through hurricanes, right? Okay. So, so okay, all okay. we do is we predict like a microburst or a wind shear at a given location, and they would go and with, oh, wow. with sensors on the plane and fly through it and make sure. Okay. It was there. Okay. Gotcha. I'm with uh, you. Now. Right. 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 And then so we'd feed that back into the model, and that's kind of the point. Um, uh, oh, and right now, right now I'm at an architecture firm, uh, and we're looking at digital twinning for for uh, architecture as well. But so, so the the difference, and and the reason that I lit up when when you guys were talking about this in the in in the early April timeframe, was there is a bizarrely enormous yet subtle difference between digital modeling and digital twinning. So all of the examples that were given in that in that specific episode, and, all, and the ones you just listed. Um, digital models are exactly what they sound like, right? You are building a digital model of a human heart. You're building a digital model of a building, of a plane, wh wh whatever it is. And it can be incredibly exacting. And you can run all sorts of tests on that digital model. You can take a digital model of a plane and run it through a digital uh, wind tunnel to see how the wind behaves over the wings and how it acts in wind shear, all that stuff, right? So, so that is all very true. The point at which it becomes a digital twin is when you start introducing real world sensors into the physical object. So in the example I gave for the FAA, that was the case. We would model a heavy weather condition, an invisible heavy weather condition. We would load this plane up with sensors. We would fly through that heavy weather condition and those sensors would inform the model and that's the key point. So you have a digital model that is, uh -huh. that, that is, that is running uh, and it can be as 
exact as you want it to be, but it's still just a model. You've used math to create that thing uh, and prior information and data that you've collected through other means. Uh, you know, you can do a CAT scan of a human being using your heart model, right? You can do a CAT scan of a human being, get down to like the nanometer on, on, on the heart itself and build that model. It looks great and you can do things to that model. It becomes a twin when you start putting uh, um, uh, cardio means devices into the heart, right? You know, it's, it's so that they can measure what's happening in the physical world. And then that physicality, that measurement of the physicality reinforms the model and software changes the model to match the reality. Okay. Right? So I, and, I think, I think I've got this, but l let me know if, if, if I'm expressing it right here. Um, so in, in those examples that we were giving, they probably sounded like models because we didn't, I, I was giving it like a surface uh, description of them. But let's go to the one from Germany, from Super Muck NG. Uh, they, they modeled blood flow in a complete mm -hmm. circulatory system. That's a model that's very good, but it's not anybody's circulatory Correct. system in particular yep. until they created the digital twin of a 26 year old wow. woman called Yunsun. That's and now right. it's her circulatory system with sensors that are sending feedback of what her actual system is doing. And they can use that to try things on Yunsun that they wouldn't actually want to try on the actual Yunsun, but they That's can try right. it on her digital twin. Is that 100%, right? hundred percent right. So, so it, 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 the, the first model you gave was, you know, they, they set up the circulatory system they probably ran computational fluid dynamic algorithms to, and, and, you know, took in the viscosity of blood, uh, as it moves through the system and and modeled exactly what they think was going to happen. The second half of that paragraph that you just gave, they were putting sensors in so that they knew, right? Yeah. So so they had this computational fluid dynamic model of blood flowing through the circulatory system. Oh, so cool. Then they put sensors in and they went, ah, our model's not quite right because we have to do this, that, and the other thing. Now, now where it gets interesting, and and this is this is where it personally interests me, um, is that in addition to sensors, you can add actuators to the equation. And an actuator is a device that takes an action. Okay. Right? So in the case of, let's talk about architecture. Let's talk about the, the, the actually, we can stay on the heart or we can talk about architecture. Uh, it, let's stay on the heart. Okay. So um, you, would, you would put as sensors, you'd, you'd put um, uh, a pulse device or a cardio means device, you're know, added to the circulatory system to take that measurement of the, of the blood flow uh, and the, the human's interaction with the blood flow and put that, present that back to the model. That is a legitimate digital twin. Mm -hmm. Now it gets interesting. Now you say, okay, I'm going to put an actuator into this equation. I'm, I'm going to put a, um, a, 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 a stimulator, electrical stimulator on the heart. Uh -huh. And now my model is, is saying, oh, okay, this person is starting to get arrhythmia. I can control the arrhythmia. Yeah by sending an electrical signal to that heart actuator and make sure, because I'm monitoring the blood flow, that what I'm doing is working. And then it can reinform itself that way and you get this feedback loop, right? That becomes interesting. In architecture, it's the same how, thing. How you, is, you would put how IoT is, sensors in a building, you would model the airflow through a building, you could control um, the, the windows and the AC and the HVAC units and the vent, uh, vent controllers so that the building is operating at peak efficiency. How is that difference from just monitoring? Like, where does the digital twin come into there's that? A com there's a computer in the middle. So there's a so, so it's doing a little like let me yeah. let me just look a, look into the future in my digital twin and see what would happen. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's the right yeah, thing yeah, yeah, to do yeah, that. Yeah. So of, you run yeah, like twenty five okay. mod like, like yeah yeah yeah. There, 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 there's something that's happening with the sensors that was. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another way to think about it. Models, All your red does that with positioning pacemakers, so that I th yeah, that makes right. sense to me. Yeah. 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 So so. Um, a, a really, really good digital model, like a beautiful digital model, it's still a model, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's it's somebody model. mathematically modeled that thing, right? And it may be, it may take into account all the latest knowledge and everyone's understanding of how blood flows through vessels and, and, and everything to do with that. But it is still just a model. It is not reality. So the second you put a sensor into that equation, now you've got a situation where you started out with the human brain's idea of what a circulatory system was, uh, and you modeled that, and then you put sensors into the actual person, and now you're getting feedback in real time or near real time so that you can take that into account in your model, right? And so now you're getting an accurate portrayal of what's happening to that specific individual, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I, 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 
Are, we're short of being able to do a digital twin of the brain. Otherwise, I'd be worried about the actuators digital twinning a robot version of me that replaces me. See, see, see your Neuralink argue, argue, yeah, right. argue, article. Yeah, right. We're short of it today. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. No. So, so anyway. Well, we should probably travel while we are still able to be ourselves before digital twins can take over. Indeed, Tom. Uh, I know you traveled recently. Uh, Chat GPT uh, is trying to help people with their travels. Chat B D GPT is encroaching on many aspects of many people's lives. And now, including on how we plan our travels, the amateur traveler is going to explain how. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. You might have heard of ChatGPT. It's gotten a little bit of press over the last few weeks. They recently announced 70 different plugins that were in beta mode on March 12th, and that included at least three big players in the travel space, Expedia, Kayak, and OpenTable. And so you can picture that you might in some time in the future be able to make your travel reservations or perhaps book a table at a restaurant near you using ChatGPT. Be interesting to see how much that's going to disrupt things. It hasn't disrupted the travel podcasting space just yet, but we shall see. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Thank you, Chris. All right, let's check out the mailbag. We got great responses to Roger's latest two cents, uh, his, uh, his, his, his newsletter. Uh, this one is titled $70 Broken Games, which addressed games being shipped before they're ready. Uh, so read a few of the responses. Um, these all came in through Patreon, so thanks, everybody. Clint wrote, Steam has added a 1.5-hour experimental free trial to the Dead Space remake. Maybe that's a little better. I guess with the free trial and two-hour return period, you can get 3.0 five hours total. I would still prefer a 14-day return, like you've suggested, Roger, especially for AAA games. B. Evil C. said, smaller companies I have some allowance for, and some do really spend time eventually delivering a quality game. No Man's Sky being an example of a rushed game that has actually become amazing over seven years since it was first released. Messaging also a part of it. A bad beta is accepted better than a bad release. If one knew the game work needed to be worked on and fixed when it was released, maybe that would be better. And then Phil wrote in, the two-hour refund limit I get for indie games. Many of them only take a few hours to complete the game, and if everyone went for the free refund after completing it, then the indie developers would lose out a lot. But there could be a different system for AAA titles or expensive games that are full of bugs. All right. That, that was great. Uh, the column from Roger is available at patreon.com slash DTNS on Thursdays. And if you are a free tier patron, you get access to that column. So uh, you can join with those folks who have been responding uh, to, to Roger's writings. Patreon.com slash DTNS doesn't cost you nothing. Yeah. Now, Len Peralta was going to illustrate today's show, but he uh, got called away with a, a last minute emergency. Uh, but I believe that he did illustrate today's show regarding Roger's emails. Uh, these are titles of, of uh, games that maybe weren't a good idea to release. Maybe they just weren't ready yet, like No Man Plays or Time Waster 6, <laughs> Little Big Software Update, which I assume just updates the software and you never actually have any other game. Uh, and of course, the ever popular Cash Grab. Yeah. I love it. Uh, you can find these uh, from Len. You can get a print of your own, digital or physical. Just go to lenperaltastore.com. I miss Len. Aw, uh, he misses we, you too. Yeah, we always miss Len when he's not here on Fridays. Uh, hopefully we'll see him next week. But it was nice to have you, Rob DeMillo, with oh, us. Oh, stop you. Oh, I won't. Um, but you cannot stop letting people know where they can keep up with you the rest of the time. Uh, if you go to my About Me page, About Me, Rob DeMillo, it's got any sort of frequent activity going on there yes i still use about me so a lot of people so, do yeah. you're not alone people do. Yeah. Yeah. uh patrons stick around for the extended show good day internet uh you get that through your rss feed on patreon so if you're a patron and you're not getting the rss feed uh you'll want to go do that uh and today is friday which means it's time for the friday quiz which also means the free tier gets this episode so get in sync with us you're not a new kid it's tech and boy bands. Stop shaking your head. You know this is going to be fun. It's going to be fun. 
You can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2000 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. This Saturday, check out the latest Live With It, featuring me talking to Chris Ashley about his experience living with the F-150, that's the Ford Lightning EV pickup. And we're off Monday for the U.S. holiday, but we are back on Tuesday with Will Smith joining us. Have a great weekend, everybody. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Well, not on the show live, but live earlier today. Acast had support from Tatiana Matias. Contributors for this week's shows include Justin Robert Young, Chris Ashley, Scott Johnson, Megan Maroney, and Chris Christensen. And our guest this week was Rob DeMillo. Thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>